I can see the slides are, are up there. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, displacement planning and humanitarian response. And this is um, thoughts arising from work that we're doing as a group in the group um, with the wonderful uh, researchers, including Boel, who's um, here at the table, and colleagues in, um, at Cardiff, including Alison, and hopefully some also have joined online. Um, but before I launch into that, I do want to introduce my speakers. And I'm hoping we also have David um, online. Um, can we just check that David is there? Perhaps give him a pin. Okay, right? <laughs> so he's not there just yet. That's a shame. But anyway, we'll start by introducing Romelu. So Romelu is Associate Professor in Urban Geography at the LSE. And Romulo's research focuses on the relationship between forced migration and urbanization. Um, in one strand of her research, she looks at how refugees and other forced migrants become city makers through building and inhabiting urban spaces. And the second strand of this work looks at the geopolitics of humanitarian knowledge production, particularly on urban refugees. Um, and this work looks at how humanitarian organizations come to learn from and intervene in urban areas. And she's currently on a British Academy Fellowship and has a podcast series called Displacement Urbanism that I hear is very good. Thank so um, David has joined us online, wonderful. Um, uh, you're not visible on, this, on our big screen, but I can see that um, you're here and we will we'll pin you up on the screen later once we've um, been through our slides. So David Aubrey is an interregional advisor at UN Habitat and providing technical and policy advice on a broad range of urban issues, including forced displacement in cities. He previously headed up UN Habitat's regional office for Arab states, and prior to that, UN Habitat's country program in Iraq, uh, where he led the UN's work on land, housing, and shelter. Uh, so um, I'm going to uh, move my slides, go to my slideshow. Is this all integrated? Am I going to go through there? This is great. Thank you. So um, working on issues of displacement, so by that I mean refugees and internally displaced people, IDPs, and other migrants, the intersection of um, of cities and uh, displacement is relatively new for IID, um, but this all this work started. Uh, this engagement with the humanitarian issues um, began around 2015 with um, the Urban Crises Program that IID led in collaboration with the International Rescue Committee, with funding as from then DFID, Department for International Development. And this work was documenting experiences of city stakeholders responding to crises. And there were a series of case studies and papers that were published, um, many of them published as working papers, but a selection also were in this special issue of um, ENU. So the title of it was Towards More Effective Humanitarian Response to Urban Crises. Um, and many of the papers in that issue do have links to urban planning. Um, so I hadn't realized I wouldn't be able to see my own slides when I was doing this, and then I have to do a slightly <laughs> odd head turn. But um, for example, there's a really interesting paper, a series of papers came out uh, external to ENU, but also in ENU, thank you, um, about area-based approaches. So if you're, in, if you're an urban development person, this is just the way you work. You take a neighborhood, a city, you think about it holistically, the different services available, the different populations. If you're humanitarian, you don't necessarily think like that. And you may actually focus more on people you consider to be disaster affected, rather than taking into consideration that disasters affect people in different ways, movements of people from one place to a, of a city to another means that it's very hard to know who's affected and who's not. There's also an article in there about making markets work for displaced people in cities, thinking more about integrating um, the, uh, the, the economies of displaced people, IDPs in this instance, uh, into planning for the for economic planning in the city. There's some work that we documented around participatory planning post-disaster, um, a great piece also, and Maggie, who's been asking questions, was involved in documenting community engagement and planning post-earthquake response in Haiti, and some papers around surging planning expertise and disaster response. And what's interesting is the editorial also makes the point that the tools of urban planning are very relevant for humanitarians, and they really call for better collaboration and joint planning between local governments and responders to crisis as a way to meet long-term urban sustainable development goals, or at the very least, not to contribute to urban fragility and vulnerability. And so that seems like quite a natural progression, actually, of the work at IID. If you think about all this work over the many decades about building resilience in urban areas. So the idea is say, how you integrate humanitarian response into planning for safer, more resilient towns and cities. So 
this work on the urban crisis program actually led to um, more research. I haven't got it all up here, but the two main projects that are sort of building on this are both about urban displacement. So the one protracted displacement in an urban world. Um, this is a comparative project looking at um, the well-being and livelihoods of refugees and IDPs in camps and urban areas in four countries because Afghanistan, Jordan, Kenya, and Ethiopia. And another project also in Jordan that is comparison of spending on water and sanitation in a camp and uh, Zatari camp in, in Mafrak city. And the idea behind these projects is really to help, well, there are many, they're big projects actually, the one on the left is, is a very big project, but one of the aims of the project is to help municipalities by providing them with more data on needs of displaced people, their contributions and their aspirations. And both these projects are comparative the comparison between the camp and the urban. And it's actually in examining these different sites of displacement in parallel triggered a series of conversations and some thoughts about city and territorial planning. Now, this is where I confess that I'm not a planner, but for some reason, about five years ago, I decided to do an MSc in urban planning. It took me a really long time to do it. And I did it because I wanted to understand more about the world of planners and what they do and how they contribute. And I <laughs> made some progress in that regard, but I'm not there yet. So I want to test some ideas and see where they might go. So one thing, first of all, is you realize that, um, can you, is that gonna disappear? That is not thing, I'm sorry. The two refugee camps, we can't quite see that, um, 5,000 kilometers apart is what it says. So one of the, the one on the left is in Dadaab in Kenya, a camp where we've been doing research, and the one on the right is Al Azraq camp in Jordan where we wanted to do research, but we were not permitted to, interestingly. So we ended up doing our research in Zachary. And there's no coincidence that even though they're really far apart, they look quite remarkably similar. So um, they, these places have been designed for control. You put refugees in a camp really far away, you put a fence around it, and you make refugees somebody else's problem. And you make them pay for it. So basically you hand over these populations to the UN, and you say, well, if you let these people in, and the UN, I'm afraid, says, well, you know, the refugee agency is uh, obviously doing all it can to keep borders open. And then when the government says, OK, let's put these people in a camp, traditionally, that is what has happened. Um, but you, if you put people in a camp, you ex exclude you exclude them from economies, from being able to move. You purposely sort of plan them out of your country in a way. But then we also know through well, our own research, but just generally it's well known that most refugees are not in camps. But data is not reliable, but it, people use the phrase 60%, the majority of the world's refugees, not in camps. Um, and, but in most countries, if they leave or circumvent the camps, they end up living in informality. Am I not working here? Oh dear, I'd like to go to my next slide. Is there a way of doing it manually on that? Are you pressing this one? Okay. Um, well, my next slide is a photo of two, uh, they're both from the Middle East. Um, and um, in one slide, there is a picture of a woman living in an informal, in unfinished building. Um, and in the other, um, a picture of uh, where people have built um, their homes on shelters on top of roofs or kind of in spaces, sort of filling in spaces. There we are. It's not neither very, the one on the right is not very clear, but you can see people sort of filling in spaces in the urban fabric to find somewhere to live. Um, and I want to tell a quick story about a recent visit to Amman, the capital of Jordan. Um, Jordan does have camps, so it has that Azraq camp, Zatri camp, and a few other small ones, but it has hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees living in cities. By far the majority of the refugees in the country are, are in towns and cities. Um, and unlike many places in the world, there are actually humanitarian resources going to refugees in the city and supporting services for them. Um, but you're not seeing that sort of visibly in terms of the places where people are ending up living. And I wanted to explore what the, the Greater Amar Municipality, the municipal authority, knew about where resources were going, humanitarian resources in the city, and who they were supporting, where they were going to. Um, and perhaps I was naively thinking that they would be wanting to engage with this, with this knowledge about where, knowing where things were going. Because if significant numbers of people are coming into the city where you're working and bringing international resources with them, I, if I were a planner, I think, I would want to know where that money was going so that I can strategize, harmonize with our own development, you know, development plans for the city, make sure the resources are spent as efficiently as possible, the maximum number of people. 
But the response we got was, well, that's not really our business. Um, that's decisions for people who are much higher up. And in, that's code in Amman for that's, that's the king's business. As in, this is so politically sensitive that any decision around where refugees will go is held, taken at the highest level within the court. And this isn't unique to the Jordan context. So if you're in uh, Kampala, as we were recently, and boel has been there recently, if you talk to the Kampala City Authority, you'll get people recognizing that there are urban refugees in the city, but decisions, oh, that, that's taken by the office of the prime minister. So again, it's sort of somewhere else. Um, and in Kenya, there's, I just saw that our colleague Jack from Macau of my CI has joined, and he's making great progress in, in encouraging the Nairobi County to think that refugees are their business. But still, there is a, a tendency to say, well, refugees, that's the, the domain of the security services. So these worlds sort of remain apart. And I guess there's no perceived dividend to hosting refugees in the city. And we did also try and talk to the Ministry of, well, we did talk to the Ministry of Planning in Jordan, just to ask how much money is going to camps, how much money is going to cities. And the answer was, we don't have that information. Um, and if you ask the UN about how much money is being spent on, their, on the camps, they don't want to say, and they possibly can't say either, because they don't track their spending by location in a way that I would have thought would be an obvious thing to do. So I came away a bit perplexed. And I did wonder if we had this data, better data on where money was going, would we be able to avoid some of these situations? Would we be able to do some preemptive planning around where refugees could be in the city, what that might cost us? Um, and I wonder about what opportunities we're missing about the, in the way things are done currently. So I want to turn over to Romola now. You've heard me speak too much today, I feel. And then Romola has been doing some related work and um, recently made visits to Greece and to Jordan and has worked in Lebanon and India on issues of urban displacement. And I want to just give Romola the opportunity just to, to chat about her, uh, whether this resonates with her own experiences, these, what, what is happening with this intersection between humanitarian action and planning, um, and what are we missing? What could we be doing differently? I'm going to pass this so it's closer to you, Romola. And I've taken it off. Oh, Very no. good. Fine. <laughs> I know how to fix things. There we go. It's working. It's working. It's working. Don't worry. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for being here. And thank you to Lucy for inviting me for this. Uh, we did say that this was going to be a bit experimental. So forgive me if I waffle a bit. Uh, but I will do my very best to stick to time. Um, I I thought about what, what Lucy had wanted to ask me. And um, this is pausing for the there. Um, I'm gonna pick up on this point that, that Lucy uh, raised about information about where people are going and um, you know why we can't get that information. And and I agree that I that that has been my experience as well. And by and large, you've find out where people are through ethnographic work. You're able to, you know, if you spend enough time in the field, you're able to go into different neighborhoods and people um, in, in these cities will tell you sort of off, you know, it's sort of a, a off the record comments about where the majority of people who are displaced are living. But in many instances, I have, I have heard people say that they, even though they do have maps and they do they they can pinpoint down to specific buildings in which people are being housed in different places they will not share that information but i have to say that i do appreciate why they they say that and a lot sometimes at and a lot of times in in many contexts it has to do with security issues um, in many countries i think we may be well aware of the kind of hostility there are towards migrants and towards forced migrants as well. Um, I know that that sort of division between my, what is considered economic and forced migrants is extremely artificial. Um, but there, there is a tendency of being quite hostile towards um, migrants and, and refugees. And for that reason, a lot of NGOs and even city officials um, who do hold this information are not willing to share that information because they're afraid of of those people being targeted and those neighborhoods being targeted as well. So this might be one of the reasons why that information is not shared. I know that doesn't answer your question, but that has come back to me as sort of one of the reasons why, and I, and I, and I invariably will not ask them for that sort of locational information being attentive to 
that kind of security issue. So I, I think that, that that would be my response to why you wouldn't get that kind of information. Um, but I think there's a, there's a sort of a, a, there were sort of other questions and, and issues that come up in terms of thinking about sort of planning and, and that sort of intersection between planning and humanitarianism. And I think I sort of jotted down a couple of things here, which, uh, um, which I wanted to just highlight as, as a couple, as things that come up in, in my work. And if I think about when, you know, when I have conversations about planning with humanitarians, the first thing that comes to mind is the word reluctance. Um, reluctant, I, and I will share an anecdote with you. I, I was at a conference a few months ago, and um, it was, and the conference was very complete. Was basically a, a conference in which there were only humanitarian organizations um, and a couple of donor organizations who were involved. I was the only person who had anything to do with planning who was invited to that to that conference, and even the people who were part of the the planning organizations and, and departments of the city were not invited. So at the end of this, I was asked to comment on, on the conversations that had taken place over the last couple of days. And I said that I, I thought it was really surprising that everybody who was, who was speaking were talking about things that planners would talk about, but they don't, but they don't see themselves as doing planning. And the response I got was, was I have to say, a, a, a quite a hostile response. <laughs> Um, and it was hostile in that there were there were some people who really objected to my using the word planning because I think what a lot of humanitarians understand to be planning is much more physical planning. They see sort of infrastructure work, they see sort of large scale interventions as being what it what what is planning. They don't sort of see the kinds of uh, work that many of us think about as planning, the sort of issues around governance, uh, the issues around thinking about local economic development, so on and so forth, as lean planning issues. Even and and even though they're doing those kinds of work, they don't see that as being planning. And this is not a, this is this is not a one off. It, it reminded me of the fact that I have encountered this not hostility, but I have but I have seen this kind of mindset over and over again that whenever I've spoken to humanitarians it, and I have asked them about you know their work and their relationship to planners, it has always been a very, oh, we don't do planning. Um, we are not involved with planning. We're simply here for the for the short term or the medium term. And so there's an enormous reluctance um, on their part to see what they do as being part of that planning universe. Then comes to the second point, which is about the medium termism, which is uh, which is something that that again I encountered in a lot of the work that I've seen is that it, I think we've had this conversation before that for for planners I think our intention really at the end of the day is to is is to make a place vibrant, to to make a, a place not just livable but but exciting and a place that that you would want to come to. So you really, you, you think about it in the long term, like, you know, how do you get a place to become interesting where people, people would want to live? Um, com contrast that with, with what humanitarians do, which is, you know, how, how do you create a place in which people can survive for, for specified, for a certain period of time? There's a very much more of a short-termism in their thinking. And of course, now we're moving into durable solutions or we have moved into durable solutions. And there's a medium termism in there. And, and it, this has come out explicitly in some of the discussions that I've had in that many humanitarians will talk about how they can only do projects that are medium term because they're not allowed to do sort of infrastructure work that will be long-term infrastructure. Um, and so this, you know, they're, they're hampered by that. Um, and that, again, you know, what, one of the problems I think that, that comes up is, is this, is, is again this divide between you know what a humanitarian is supposed to do and what their their funding enables them to do and and what you would expect out of planning if we believe that humanitarian funding is constantly shifting and it just moves from one crisis to another i mean you know the, the money will go towards the next big crisis and be taken away from from another place and you'll see dips in funding how do you then create planning program. I mean, you know, how do you then invest in the long term, engage with communities in the long term? And again, it's something that a lot of 
organizations, NGOs that I've spoken to have raised that, you know, this kind of work in urban environments requires a significant engagement with communities over a long period of time. And they don't really have that if every year they have to renew a project with a donor. Um, I'm actually going to stop there because I, I, I'm, I'm conscious of times. So I'm, I'm going to stop. But I think that, you know, these are certainly some of the things that have come up di when it comes to sort of direct discussions around planning that helps with the discussion. I think it definitely helps. Thank you, Romila. Worry about touching this microphone in case I break do it. what I did. Um, and I want to I want to hand over now to David Aubrey, who's joined us online. So David is someone who ha was a is a built environment professional by background. I think he's an architect um, and has worked in urban design, but is now um, working uh, within the UN system and has some more positive, I think, examples of how how we could use planning to um, create better, more vibrant, more livable places for people who are on the move. So. Um, David, I'm going to hand over to you, and you've got a couple of slides, so just uh, let us know when you want just to put those up. The floor is yours. Okay. Th thanks very much. Really sorry to get you. I can't be with you, actually. I'm, I'm flying to the UK tonight, like half a day too late. So I'm, I'm sorry for that, but it's a real, uh, you know, I feel very honoured to join you and seeing a few familiar faces in the crowd, so that's great. Um, I, yeah, so I think we have, I, I think it's been fairly well established now that planning, urban planning, spatial planning, uh, either as a social process or as a physical process or a bit of both, it, is, it needs to be integral in, in the work of responding to uh, displacement. And I think displacement is becoming sadly much more of, much more of a norm. And so displacement needs to be an important consideration in planning. Uh, particularly in some places. And I, and I think uh, uh, Lucy and I um, worked with uh, GIPS on, on a, a paper for the um, for the Secretary General's panel on in, internal displacement where we made a strong case for this. And now, now that there's been a, an appointed uh, advisor, special advisor to the Secretary General on displacement, we're seeing that uh, mm -hmm. uh, he is very interested and in really trying to bring uh, this work on urban planning much stronger into displacement crisis. So I, I think this it is moving, and and I appreciate what you know that that planning takes many different forms, and and I think as a social process we've seen that has really been important in, for instance, in Lebanon integrating urban refugees with host communities around public spaces and things like this. So so they've been quite important processes of of integration, but I want to talk a little bit about. Um, uh, territorial planning. Well, is is not new that uh, you know the competition for uh, natural resources uh, often leads uh, results in conflict, and with climate change, we're seeing th this kind of becoming bigger. And and there are a lot of places now where uh, we're we're seeing we're going from the idea of protracted crisis almost to perpetual crisis as as droughts and conflict coexist and people seem to be endlessly on the move mm -hmm. and um when you see somalia for example there the, the, i've been working a bit in baidoa yeah. and we see that that city has has absolutely uh, expanded uh you know tripled in size in in the last 10 or 15 years and people move to where they feel safe. They move to where they feel that they could have opportunities in life. They feel they move to where there's some basic assets such as health and education and different things, uh, but particularly security. And they move to where there's humanitarian support. So naturally, all over Southwest State in Somalia, people have been moving to Baidoa, and the the city has now grown at a I would say an uncontrollable rate. And um, and it's not sustainable. Uh, you know, when you you have people are digging holes for for water naturally, and the water table is reduced so rapidly and and uh, so deeply that there'll be a time where that city cannot sustain itself anymore. Um, and so um, we also find that because people tend to move to the larger cities in in a lot of these situations that it's very difficult for them to return, especially if they're coming from a rural economy. 
And you know, what about if we would what about if we would try to understand displacement as as a norm, as a something that we have to deal with? Uh, well, why don't we start understanding displacement not as a as as a crisis that we need to respond to, but a, a, an important factor of planning, uh, particularly in in those countries that seem to be in perpetual crisis. And um, what about if people could move to places, smaller cities, closer to their rural homes? What about if those places had those basic factors of education, health, maybe water, safety, security, humanitarian support? Um, and, and this might be quite interesting because over time, you might find that even the sort of family economy might be more diverse. You know, you might be a pastoralist, your daughter might be a teacher in the school. And so you're not affected in the same way as a result of crisis. And you might have places, you, you, you might be able to respond better uh, to a crisis and still be able to keep a hand on your rural economy and return to it. So the idea of proximity is, is quite important. So if you just put up the slide, what we've started to do in, in Sahel, for instance, and even this morning we were talking to, I was talking to IOM about Baidoa. In fact, I was asked, I was actually, I think there might be something coming up for the, for the three of us there. Um, but um, we, we started to map all the human settlements across, across the, uh, you know, across seven or eight countries. And we've started to look at um, overlaying that with uh, the typical movements of people as a result of conflict and as, as a result of drought. And if you go to the next slide, we've started to map the assets of those, uh, uh, those human settlements. So on the top axis horizontally, you've got all the stuff, all the public assets, you know, whether there's water, electricity, schools, hospitals, secondary schools, and the rest of it. The, the things, uh, economic opportunities and the rest, and on the vertical axis, starting from large cities to small cities, we've started to, to, to map. Um, and so with that, we're able to start mapping uh, what assets exist where. And then if we go back to the previous slide, if we can identify then uh, where people are likely to move to, and where, if you go back to the previous slide, with, with Sorry, when I'm you understand, gonna... yeah, when you, when you start understanding the distribution of assets, you might understand where people are moving to now and why some of the larger cities are growing very, very fast and why some of the smaller cities are not even moving. Um, and then you can start looking at, um, you know, would there be more logical places for people to move to closer to their place of origin, which would still be safe, which could still have the basic infrastructure that could have um, a, a security, et cetera. And should we be sort of targeting investment into those areas in order to provide greater options for people on the move and also to take the pressure off the cities that are growing so fast that they're growing informally and through a sprawl. This I think requires a sort of a proactive approach and it requires development actors to work with humanitarians because it's key that people are still moving to cities because they get support there um, but also to, to work with uh, security and uh, you, you know, peacekeeping and, and that scale as well. So I'm just putting that out there. But I, I do think then this approach, displacement then could become a positive force for urbanization in that by, by through a territorial planning approach, you can start identifying market towns, places that could be market towns, places that could support an urban, a rural urban economy, urban, rural urban value chains, and actually the movement of people to those places could actually be an asset to the local and territorial economies. And I'll leave it there as, as further food, food for thought. It is something that we started doing in Sahel, we'll be starting to do it in, um, in Somalia, and it's a it's a really about bringing the humanitarian actors, development actors, urban planners, uh, and and also IFIs together with local and regional government in that conversation about how how perpetual crisis can be dealt with or can be can be yeah can be a factor of um, of displacement rather than a shock each time. Thank you. 
Thank you, David. Planning, sorry. And thank you to Romla as well. Um, am I right in thinking I've got about 15 minutes left for the session? So um, I guess I should first ask, um, have there been any questions online or is there anybody who's put up their hand? We have one for Maggie. Okay, so I, <laughs> Maggie, um, who's <clears throat> very good at asking difficult questions. So Maggie Stevenson, who I mentioned, um, we'd worked with her on an IID publication about Haiti. So do you think you could track that data in the UK and cities? So is this the data of where people are moving to or the data of where spending is going, Maggie? You can unmute yourself and, and ask your, I think you can ask your question you can have well, a <laughs> Sorry for all the questions. You were talking about the, your expectation of data that would be available or data that would be possible or maybe even fast to collect. And I'm curious to know how, if you think the same is easily accessible in the UK or, or if it would face similar challenges. I don't work in the UK context, but from the... I don't work in the UK context, but I... No, it, it was Lu it was Lucy's point about uh, data. I know, but I'm asking so much Lucy, to Lucy is, is making me answer for her. <laughs> um, I, I don't yeah, know. I, I, th I think it is available to an, to an extent. And I, I, the, some, of the, some of the people I know who have been working on these issues, um, they have been able to access data. I mean, I think this was a question about humanitarian funding coming into Jordan to respond to a specific event of the arrival of Syrian refugees and the Ministry of Planning not being able to easily tell you where that money had gone across its territory. So not even at the level of different governorates, let alone between just generally between the camps, which are sort of, you know, they're finite places. There are fences around them. You would think they would... I just assume that they would they would know where that money was going and they'd be interested in knowing where it was going. But maybe this is me by being naive. Maybe. Um, Alison has a hand up. Alison, can you do what you did before? Because apparently sound worked, sound worked very well, apparently, for people online. Thank you. Um, thank you. I wanted just to thank the presenters for some great, uh, great thoughts. And I wanted, if I could, to connect them a little bit more from David's territorial presentation, which, which I think is fantastic. And I haven't, I haven't seen, seen before. There's some of the ground work that Roman is doing. And what, what about, about public space? space? One what? of the things that, that I think about those photographs you showed us, Lucy, is that there's no public space. There's no center around the mosque. There might be a book in the kitchen if you're lucky. Um, we had a fantastic PhD in Cardiff University, where I'm from, and she's now 10 years into her career, uh, Christine Lady, who looked at the role of public space in reconciliation of the various communities in Lebanon. And she, she found some wonderful examples. And that's quite a, an easy win mm -hmm. if we think about spaces as spaces of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And we can also think about, about that hunt. So there are, maybe there are centers where communities like the refugee centers mm -hmm. in Addis Ababa. But the other thing that we can start around, we talked about in the just the local government, mm -hmm. because the international community, like UN Habitat, talks to other international agencies in the nation states. Local government gets pushed to the edge. Local government is often underfunded, particularly in the secondary cities. It's not, not a fashionable place to work. It's a front of implementation. So I would love to have colleagues who speak to some of those issues. Public space is open for government. So I want to ask David to come in and tell us his story about what happened when a camp planner was allowed to do some urban planning in, was it by Doha? And what happened as a result oh. in terms of the public space issue? Will you tell us that story? Uh, and I have a positive one I could add as well. Um, yeah, it's so all very well-meaning, fantastic government land, you know, available. They said, we want to be proactive about IDPs. Here's land that could be used by IDPs for housing, and we will make it permanent, and we'll have permanent houses there. And it was quite interesting. I came in at that point, and I, I was saying, well, make 
you know, let's design it for the city. And of course, uh, the, the, you know, we can have mixed use, we can have commercial and housing and different type of houses to, to meet different needs. Um, but anyway, a camp planner came along and they, they designed it in accordance probably with sphere standards, I think. Um, and, and they were all little blocks of maybe 20, 40 houses with a sort of a space in, bet in, in, in between those houses. And, and it was, it, I thought it was a bit unfortunate because there was no open public space. It was just lots of semi-private spaces. And of course, when people move from rural areas to urban areas, they, they're kind of, their social model, they're, they're, the society changes for them. But unfortunately, with this model, it was perpetuating this sort of sense of um, subclans. You know, you, you came from that village, you'd end up in this block, and you'd have this very sort of insular life within the, within the city. And in, in a way, that plan plan process and you know inadvertently sort of led to almost like a concentration of villages that didn't talk to each other rather than a city that was, you know, open to all. And we do talk about the right to the city and public space is a key element of that right to the city. And when, when you don't have that public space that's open to all, but a series of semi-private spaces that reinforces the sort of sub-clan village kind of mentality, I, it, was a lost, it was a lost opportunity. But anyway, the mayor, uh, Whittim of, um, of Baido of Abastus to come back and actually try and fix things. So we, we're looking forward to trying to do that. Uh, but a positive one, just a really quick one, was working with um, refugees, Syrian refugees and Lebanese host communities in Beirut, where the public space was, was tiny. But we, and of course, we, we used Minecraft because sometimes young people, they might not have much to say to each other. They sometimes need a digital space to start communicating to each other. And they modeled the public space and they started to interact with each other in Minecraft until they got to a point where they'd co-designed the space. And then that, that space was actually then built. And the refugees and the host communities felt the common sense of ownership of that public space. And then later on, the public, same public space was used to host meetings of the parents uh, of refugees and host communities. And it became this kind of place of bringing together communities. And, and it was just such a lovely, brilliant process. And I think um, Bartlett have done some work on it further, DESID, I think they called um, some unit. Um, but I, I, think, I think public space and public space co-creation as a social process is just a really powerful thing. Um, back to you. Do you want to talk more? Or what would you say? Well, I can see some question, another question in the room. So should we we've got time for another question in the room? I think so. Um, hi. Okay, so I was asked about the hostility question. Um, what, what I, you know, where I experienced that. And I was also asked what I meant by the term forced migrants. Um, I'm not sure I can tell you where, in what context um, I, I encountered that because it was, it, 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 it was not, it, this was more Chatham House rules. And so we were not meant to have a discussion about, you know, who said what, where. Um, but it was in the Middle East, if that helps to narrow down the region. Um, and and I have ex I have seen this in a, in in instances in the Middle East. But I'm not talking about the UN organizations. It's not been so much, although the UN uh, different um, UN institutions institutions have said different things as well, which I'm happy to chat about separately. Um, but the, these are their many of the implementing partners. Um, have 
expressed some concerns around using such terms. Um, so that that's to answer your question on the first one. The second question is that what 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 do I mean by forced migrants? Uh, I have to say I'm a bit uncomfortable using this term, uh, but I was using this because we were talking about crisis and urban crises and why I'm uncomfortable using this term because I, I, I'm very uncomfortable in, in, as I said, that, you know, this binary between what constitutes an economic migrant and what constitutes a quote, quote unquote forced migrant is really problematic. I mean, that boundary is so incredibly blurred. Um, you know what? What you know? Economic, can, you know, situations can make you a forced migrant, and vice versa. So, you know, where do we start to draw the line? You know, are you leaving because you're starving because you don't have, you know, livelihood opportunities? Are you leaving because of, of a, a a disaster that has led you into poverty? You know, what what is you know? The, a lot of these issues are intertwined, and I know that there have been in, enough scholarship in this field. Uh, so I don't need to repeat that, but yeah, I, I I am not comfortable using this term. I was only using this because we were talking about this sort of crisis kind of issue and, and a specific point about, you know, where do you find the refugees and, you know, where do you find, you know, the the, the IDPs and, and how do you know what the, where the spending is going for them that, that I raised that particular point, um, but I wouldn't necessarily otherwise. Can I just come back to your to your question about municipal government? Um, I completely agree with this point that it's the municipal governments who are at the forefront of, of having to manage the situations. And that has really been the thrust of the, the work that I've been trying to do is, is to work with municipal governments to try and understand what they're doing and, and what their involvement in is. And of course, everything is very context specific. So um, in some places, like in Greece, the, the municipal governments are, are much more involved in, in, some, in, in the management of, or were more involved in the management of the, the asylum issue um, in Greece until, of course, last year when they started shutting down all the programs. And now if you are an asylum seeker in Greece, you simply go to a camp. Um, in Jordan, it's actually quite interesting. <laughs> um, Lucy and I have had some interesting experiences in Jordan. Um, Really, it's the Greater Amman municipality that has the power to make certain kinds of decisions in in relation to many of these other issues. When I have spoken to NGOs and people um, within the government in Jordan, other municipalities are simply not empowered to have these discussions. And when I've had conversations with them about, well, doesn't the municipality have a say in where you've decided to improve the school or where you've decided to house people or where you've decided to, because Jordan is a much more centralized system than Lebanon, where I've also worked. They've just been like, no, it's not the responsibility of the municipality. They simply are not empowered to have those discussions. It's quite different to Lebanon where, and, and I'm speaking for 2016, so I want to contextualize the date. Um, there were municipalities who were very unhappy with a lot of NGOs saying that they had not adequately engaged with them when they decided to intervene um, in the municipal areas to support displaced people. So it's very much of a, of a mixed sort of bag. But yes, I, I, you know, I mean, there, there needs to be much more of an engagement. I think we can all agree that there needs to be much more engagement with local governments because they're the ones who ultimately are facing the crises on the ground. So I, I know that we've got um, David Satterthwaite online with his hand up. David, do you want to ask us a difficult question or make a comment? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, so just a quick comment. I've, I've had 50 years experience of visiting countries where governments have tried to decentralize urban development and to support small towns. And governments are very good at picking all the wrong cities. Cities that would have boomed with support are ignored because the president needs the um, <laughs> the airport near his constituency. And I think we're getting things around the wrong way. Secondary cities will, will, will grow if their economy is successful, not the other way around. So as the question is sort of 
finding the sweet spot, the cities that could grow and could be successful places of enterprise and could provide decent homes for people on the move, I guess. Yes, but yes, but also um, most of the world's fastest growing cities are small cities too. We, we, we underestimate that. And in some ways I would look for the the secondary cities or these small urban centers that are growing rapidly and look to see whether they wouldn't have the much more capacity than small towns that are growing slowly that are kind of economically stagnant. Good point. Um, am I allowed to take one more in the room? Um, Alejandro's looking at me. Okay, Alejandro. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed your reflection on, on basically um, the, the, the difficulties of accommodating um, the needs of migrants within kind of the landscape of identity and responsibility of the different, different institutions, whether humanitarians looking at short-term planning or not planning at all, or municipalities basically not having the kind of responsibility or um, to basically plan for that type of population. You get the stuck into a landscape of accountabilities and legitimacies that cannot be moved actually and if you continue to to look at the problem maybe as a struggle problem that needs to shift this legitimacies and responsibilities where you can actually move it maybe you can maybe you cannot but then my proposition basically to you is how you actually try to resolve this impasse if you basically look at it as a proliferation basically a difference so what kind of connections can be done between institutional organizations that exist in place? So basically new legitimacies and responsibilities emerge, basically. That would be my question. If you, if you have any thoughts, thanks. I'd love to respond to Professor Satisfait. Um, no, I, I think this is... <laughs> Oh, okay. He's not there. Shall I, oh, no, he can't hear us. Shall I respond to Dr. S uh, to Professor Sathis, right? Hello? Yeah. Yes. Apologies, he, um, David, go ahead. Can you hear? Okay, sure. No, I, I'm completely with you. I, I, I think there's a huge need, and I, just from an urban perspective, when we're expecting 2.5 billion more people to move to cities in the next 30 years, it has to be small cities, it has to be secondary cities. And that is an opportunity because that also helps to balance economic growth across the across the countries, across territories. And um, it, it's so important that attention is spent, is paid on to secondary cities. Now, when it comes to displacement crisis, people are looking for a place that's safe, that may offer economic opportunities, that there are public services and public assets, and that there's humanitarian support. And I think it's it's possible with the humanitarian crisis to try and help push sustainable urban territorial development in the right in the right way by bringing humanitarian support to secondary cities. And I think all too often humanitarians, are, you know, it takes an effort to set up your base and you need to have all these security provisions and stuff like this. So it makes sense to, for the humanitarians to congregate in the larger cities. But supposing there was another way where we could say put humanitarian support in decentralize it into into smaller cities and more of them uh, that might also help to steer population growth in a way that could be conducive to supporting the growth and the the vibrancy of of secondary cities and i don't almost say the same when it comes to uh, kind of security why not you, you know we the, the peacekeepers are trying to reinforce certain cities and others that they're leaving behind and we have to look at this nexus of, of uh, security economic opportunities public services and humanitarian support to make cities able to uh, to, to to work uh, better for a situation of perpetual crisis and then that takes different planning dimensions from territorial planning to look at the urban rural linkages and to understand where a city might fit or a human settlement fits within a landscape of, of um, urban rural economies. And this is my sort of concern with Kakuma and Kalo Bay. It's, it's far too big. They've decided to make this camp into a city. And when the 
low, when the territorial economy is is based is in a semi-arid area is based on sort of market towns, uh, the, the size of that city will not sustain itself, and uh, it needs to it needs to be reduced. Otherwise, it will always require humanitarian support. Anyway, I can go on for too long, so let me give the floor back quickly. But thanks so much for the question, Professor.